Well, good evening. I'm Mark, one of the pastors here, and we are in a series studying the book of Mark. I thought that would be a good book to go through. And uh, actually, I was, I was hanging out with one of my friends, Matt Heverly, who's a pastor at the Edgewater Fellowship, and we were talking, and he asked, so, hey, Mark, wh- where, are you, where are you studying? What, what book are you teaching through? And I said, uh, Mark. And he goes, oh, he goes, that's really funny. And, and Matt said, I'm teaching Matthew. <laughs> These egomaniac pastors here in town. <clears throat> so we're at the point in the book of Mark where Jesus is placing special emphasis on following. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And we need to get his definition because there's a lot of crazy ideas out there about what it means to follow Jesus. So let's, let's see what Jesus has to say. So we're in this mini-series following Jesus over a couple of weeks. We're in Mark 9 and verse uh, 33. So this week, uh, my daughter, my adult daughter, Natalie, and I were uh, headed out to lunch, and we walked out of the church office, and we're going to my car, and in front of us, uh, we see Brian Lucas, who's the director of our facilities, and he's going to lunch with his, like, three-year-old little daughter, Kiara, and And as I'm following them, it was just like, I mean, it was a surreal moment to see, like, it seemed like yesterday. And I'm like, Brian, like, what's going on? You daddy-daughter lunch? You're like, yeah. And I said, it goes fast, bro. It goes really fast. And so with that scene kind of in my head, and I sort of did like a 24-year movie, you know, just kind of in 10 seconds flashed before my eyes going down memory lane, uh, leads us to our title today, Lessons from a Toddler. Lessons uh, from a Toddler. And three vital questions that we need to ask today. How to be truly great. These are questions Jesus is going to be dealing with here. How to be truly great. How do I get into God's kingdom? And why is this the best path? How to be great. How to get into God's kingdom. And why is this the best path? So the first question, how to be truly great. Pick up with verse 33, Mark 9. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. So the disciples were on the road walking with Jesus, and I mean, this is crazy to think about it. They're actually having this argument. Can you picture it? It's like, oh, no, I'm the best. Oh, no, no, I think I'm greater than you. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm better than all of you put together. I mean, these guys are like arguing over who's the greatest, And so they get to this house in Capernaum, most likely Peter's house. And Jesus asks them, hey, you know, what were you guys arguing about on the road? And they know they're busted. And uh, maybe they didn't think Jesus could hear, but Jesus has bionic ears, just like all moms. And uh, so Jesus, who heard what they were talking about, asks them, you know, what were you talking about? And and, and, and now that it's out in the open, and Matthew in his gospel helps us with this, uh, it's like now that it's out in the open, they, they ask, okay, well, Jesus, can you just settle this? Like, who amongst us is the best? So they actually uh, are comfortable to ask Jesus to, to take care of this argument. Like, who is your favorite? Who's the highest ranking in the kingdom? Blows my mind that these guys are stuck on this. Okay, these are Jesus' disciples. This is his life group, all right? I mean, this is his varsity. This is his A team. These are the guys that will change the world. (laughs) And they're still stuck on themselves and their ego and who's the greatest and selfish ambition, okay? And, And by the way, just a side note here, I think it's important to point out, you know, some people ask, is the Bible really true? Like, are these gospel stories credible? And what if the disciples just made up all these stories? But think about it. It's, it's stories like this that prove they didn't make it up. Because if you're going to write a religion, you're not going to make yourself look so bad. It's one of the reasons that the gospels are so credible because of how uh, the, the bad and, and the ugly all come out about uh, these uh, these, these uh, men of God, these men of Jesus. So 
Back to the question, how do we become great? And of course, in our culture, we define it different ways, you know, through strength, through success. We value beauty and appearance. We value how people perceive us. We, we value money and what it can do for us. I mean, ask, ask a sixth grader uh, what they're going to do when they grow up, and it's going to have something to do with being rich and famous. It's all about possessions, positions, power, popularity. People do crazy stuff to get one of those four. Don't believe me? Watch an episode of American Greed. People do crazy things to be popular, to get possessions, power, position. Do whatever it takes to make yourself look good, to give yourself the most honor and pleasure. So Jesus wanted to deal with this. Verse 35, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He says, greatness is not being first. It's the opposite. It's being last. I love the message translation of this verse in the Message Bible. So you want to be first place? Then take last place. Be a servant of all. So Jesus wants us to be great. He really does. He's not anti-greatness. I, I mean, the, the, thing that, the thing we should realize is he wants us to achieve greatness, but it, the, the path is countercultural and it's radical. He, he's saying, you want the first place with me, then put others first. And of course, he's not talking about trying to lose. I'm going to try to lose so you can be first. He's not saying that, you know, there's, there's areas of competition, of course, that are fine. And, and, you know, and trying to be your best and to excel, of course, that's fine. He's talking specifically about a mentality of putting others first, lifting others up, trying to make their day. Because service is what love's all about. Like we could say, oh, I love you. But service is love in action. Right? I mean, that's really how you define love. How are we serving in our home? How are we serving with our friendships? How are we serving in the, in, in the Lord's church? And it's that attitude of not so much I do acts of service, so that makes me a servant. It's that I'm a servant, so that means I, I do acts of service for the Lord and for people. It simply means trying to outdo one another in service. I love the picture that outdo one another in service rather than keeping track of our service. Try to out. Can you imagine if marriage is really like that? Trying to outdo each other in acts of service rather than keeping score. So, shocking statement for Jesus to use this picture of the servant. Like in our culture, we don't have servants and slaves, no matter what you think of your job. So I think in the Christian church, we've kind of, we've kind of glorified this term. And because we don't have slaves in our culture, in that day, slaves were at the bottom, bottom of the realm, of the ladder in that culture. Nobody wanted their kid to grow up to be a slave. Nobody said, hey, where can I sign up to be a servant? Nobody. So this was shocking and radical. And then what Jesus does is even... Uh, more shocking, this is classic, he takes this visual illustration, maybe one of his best ever when it comes to all the visuals that Jesus used, and he took this little uh, kid, a toddler, and possibly Peter's uh, child. And in verse 36, he took this child in his arms, and, and he said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome or not just welcome me but the one who sent me his father so jesus is saying greatness is through serving but let me get more specific with you how to be truly great welcome a child that's exactly what he's saying welcome a child and this word welcome means to receive it means a warm reception another shocking statement by jesus i mean that culture children were like in the family, like children were like seen and not heard. Completely different perspective on children in that culture than in our culture. Like in our culture, it's 
If anything, it's like extreme the other way, even too much. Ours is a child-centered culture where if we're not careful in our families, everything revolves around the child, which, and you've heard me talk about that, that's not good either. But, but here in this culture, it was the exact opposite. In ancient Israel, it was like, you know, as far as kids, they were the least important member of the family. They had no say, no rights, no status. Ancient culture valued age and wisdom, not youth. And so even among the religious leaders, they, they thought that way. We read this in the Talmud. Morning sleep, midday wine, chattering with children, this is the way to ruin your life. So that was the mentality. So Jesus' statement's radical. You want to be truly great? Welcome a child. And the kids were always around Jesus, weren't they? We see that through the Gospels. Gives us a glimpse into the kind of person that he was, the personality that he had. Smile that must have been on his face. That winsome, I want to be with the kids, kind of an attitude that was so different in that culture. In verse 13 of chapter 10, the other text that we're looking at today, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And he took the child in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. So these disciples, they're like shooing them away. Hey, he's busy. Hey, scram, beat it, you know. And it says that Jesus, Mark records here, he's paying special attention. Indignant. That's a strong word. It means absolutely disgusted and angry at something that's just so wrong. To not receive and welcome the kids is just so wrong, Jesus is saying. He blessed the kids. He'd be the one out in the lobby on the rug, you know, playing with the kids in the children's classrooms. We read in, oh, and by the way, don't miss this. He says, when you do this and welcome a child, you welcome me. Oh, and not just me, but my father. Man, that's a reality check. Our reception of a child is is how we receive Jesus. It's just, hey, Jesus, I'm receiving you. Now, just an aside here, this word child can mean more than just literal child. It could, this phrase could also be translated, one such as these children. And, and so that's a more application for us, very important, not just the child, to welcome the child, but those who are like a child. You say, well, in what way? In ways that our culture might look at someone and they say that person is really small in the eyes of the culture. That person is unimportant in the eyes of the culture. Jesus is saying true greatness comes from welcoming those who our culture might deem not as important, not as significant, who who perhaps the culture would say, you don't have a lot to offer to me socially or relationally or whatever it might be. Jesus is saying, you welcome them, you welcome me. And I thought, wow, is that ever a word the church needs to hear about a willingness to welcome all people? The church, we, you know, if we're not careful, myself included, myself especially, in respecter of persons and those who, well, that kind of a person, they're, 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 the, they're the ones all, all, they can be in my life group. But, oh, that other kind of person, mm, let's see who I can find for them. And we get these feelings about who we can spend time with and who we like and who we're going to be seen with. And it's like, that is so of the world. It's not of the heart of Jesus. He says, you welcome them. You welcome me. When you don't welcome them, it's like Jesus saying, you're blowing me off. It's heavy. It's a reality check. 
and I don't have the time to get into all different examples of what the, the kinds of, we, we, know, we know what he's talking about. There are people that are just different than us, who we don't connect with potentially as, as much as, as others, but do we still welcome them? Jesus says, that's how you welcome me. So that's greatness. Like Jesus says, where I come from, we measure it differently. We've got a different, my, my dad and I, we've got a different standard of greatness. Welcome a child or one who's like a child. Second question. Well, then how do we get into the kingdom? Which is what Jesus has been talking about all along here. Well, there in the middle of that section in chapter 10 in verse 15, which I, I removed for our last point, but I'll put it back in for this point. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So now he's using a child in a different kind of an illustration. He's saying now there's something about a child that can get you, that, that, that lesson that will get you into the kingdom. Matthew 18, 3 he said, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So how do I get into the kingdom? Become like a child. How to be great? Welcome a child. How to get into the kingdom? Become like a child. What does Jesus mean by this? Well, in the Bible, the people of God are given many different names, and, and, and I think maybe the most intimate and the greatest name we are given is the name children of God. And there's a lot of implications with that title. I think as adults who grow up in life, we don't take the time, I think, to sit down and just ponder and reflect the significance of what it means to be a child of God. The fact that we have this great position and identity as the king's kids as well as the truth that um, whatever our job might be, wherever we might live, car we might drive, all those things that life has for us or that we accomplish in life, like to whatever degree that's, um, to whatever degree that is in our lives, the fact is as Christians, we're just kids, we're just the children of God. Right? I mean, we're just, we're just his kids, spiritual children, spiritually weak, very much imperfect, dependent, often ignorant, often selfish, too often stubborn, vulnerable children. We're not the high and mighty and the great and the profound. We're children at best, Right? the children of God. In Luke 10, 21, Jesus, and he's not talking about literal children. He's talking about his disciples. It's a very interesting statement. He said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. So he's making this statement about his disciples. And even though they had all the struggles that they had, what he's saying here is, Father, thank you. They're, they're starting to get it. They're, they're childlike. They're not like the religious leaders who are so filled with pride and self-righteousness. Thank you, Father, that these disciples are like the children, spiritually speaking. So here's what Jesus is getting at. Let me see if I can take a stab at this. As adults, as we grow up, which is a good thing, you know, you don't want to stay in sixth grade your whole life. But as we, you know, are growing up, we become more complex, more responsible. We get independent. We get really serious about life, making it work for us. We get concerned about, and some of us to a greater degree than others, but concerned about performance, concerned about, you know, um, our image and those kinds of things. And Jesus is saying a lot about grown-up stuff, just the realities of grown-up stuff, can really hurt our relationship with God if we're not careful. And then add on top of all of that, 
the hurts, the hang-ups, the broken relationships, those, those school of heart, all those tough things that have happened in our lives that, that maybe can create walls and barriers and, and bad habits and those types of things. This, this can really hurt our walk with Jesus. And so what Jesus is saying, he's saying, take some spiritual lessons from a child about what a relationship with Father God is really all about. He says, we must, it's not like optional. He says, we must change, the words repent, must change and be like a child. And it's a very interesting concept because in many ways, children are not the ideal, are they? I mean, in many ways, you think about children, they can be selfish, they're always thinking about me, and, and they could even be violent, you know, throw their truck at another kid, hit him in the head, you know. I mean, children, uh, they can lie. These are things you got to train and discipline out of children, right? I mean, I remember my, my son Cody, quite possibly the easiest kid on the planet to raise, okay? The other three, different story, all right? But, uh, but I'm tell, just telling you, maybe the easiest kid in the world to ever raise. Even Cody at four, one day at the park, sweet little girl comes up to him, and she's maybe four or three or something, and she's like, she's, <laughs> she, uh, she's just like, how does your tractor work? He's got his little tractor there. To which Cody replies, get away, stinky, it's mine. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of the way kids can be. <laughs> so certainly Jesus is not saying every aspect of what it means to be a child is what you're trying to get at, all right? I mean, for the purposes of this study, I think we can pretty much sum it up this way. There's childlike and there's childish, right? And Jesus is saying, try to be childlike. Let me help you be childlike, not childish, okay? Childish is not good. Now, Jesus, he isn't saying, in addition, that we don't mature as human beings. We should try to grow up. We should try to become a responsible adult in this life. That's not to set that aside at all. Just like he's also not saying that we shouldn't try to grow up as spiritual uh, children of God, to try to grow up into somebody who helps other Christians grow. We call it, call it spiritual parenting into life group leadership and other ministry teams. That's so important that we have spiritual parents. So Jesus is saying, look, we still need that, but understand that at the core of it all, I'm your dad and you're my kid. And let's Let's do something really special here together. Let, let, dwell on that. Romans 8, 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. The word Abba means Papa. It's more of an endearing. Some, someone even said like Dad. Papa. Almighty, holy, perfect creator of heaven and earth wants us to call him Papa. And of course, every earthly dad makes mistakes, small ways, and, and, and sometimes in very, very big ways. And isn't it great that we have this heavenly Papa who fills in all those gaps and, and will heal all those wounds that come from earthly fathers, those gaps that Earthly fathers fall short in. So Jesus is making it perfectly clear that we must come to Father God and live our Christian lives in the same way as a toddler relates to parents. So what I did is I took a few minutes. This was a little more difficult because all my kids are like all old now. And, um, <laughs> and I guess that makes me really old. And so went down memory lane to, to look at what are these qualities he's talking about. And so I, I, I got the, the acronym TODDLER. You can see it there in your notes. And we're going to just hit you with, a, with seven quick characteristics that define and, and describe this relationship with, with a, between a toddler and, and a parent, specifically father. So lesson one is trust. 
right? I mean, if, if little kids are about anything, it's trust. Dwayne talked about it last week. His kids, they get too high in the tree. He says, let go, and they do. They just fall into his arms. I remember long before my kids could swim, they just jumped right, come, jump in the pool. I mean, I could have just swam away and they just would have drowned. I mean, they trusted me. They believed me. And, and, and they had the most trust in me when I was with them. And here's the thing. They thought I could fix everything. I'm mean, One of the big things about being a, a father, I learned to fix a lot of things just because they thought I could. You know? And it cost me to get in there and try to figure out some stuff. It was interesting, okay? Half my life spent fixing things. But you know, it's just that faith, that trust that they have. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. When do we start getting all stressed and anxious and worried? When we're looking at people, we're looking at circumstances. But if we're looking at Father God, our eyes are on Dad. Oh, man, we have peace. So trust. Dad, you're in total control. The O in toddler is optimism. You notice how kids are just so positive, so optimistic. I mean, anything's possible. I remember when Tyler, my oldest, he's a little guy, and uh, he's like, Dad, let's just make a rocket pack. I actually thought I could make him a rocket pack, you know? That you know, was just last year when he asked me that. And uh, no. <laughs> it's just so optimistic, so positive. As older people, we can get so negative and cynical and overly cautious. Philippians 4, verse 8, brothers, whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You could always focus on the negative, on what isn't good, on what's not working. With Father God, we can say, God, you make my life positive. You, you, you are so amazing. We can be optimistic in our relationship with you. The third lesson is dependence. If children are anything, they're dependent. I mean, you think about like a child is not really able to offer much of anything to the productivity of a family, right? It's just a big sucking sound. I mean, they just take and take and take, and they're so dependent and they can hardly do anything without their parents' help. And, and they know that. And they're okay with that. And they're really good at asking for help. And they're really good at, at receiving gifts and things that, that they know they can't pay back. Does it sound like grace? Does it sound like our relationship with Father God? That he's just good and he's great because that's just who he is. And John 15, 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do Nothing. So it's that dependence before the Lord. Oh, I need you, Lord. Every hour I need you. Lesson four. Dependence. Oh, I already said it. Well, I needed a second D, and I didn't want to pick him up with a new word. I figured that we needed to hear it twice. Dependence. Lesson five. Laughter. You guys notice how much kids laugh? They're just, studies have shown the average preschooler laughs 400 times a day. The average adult, 15. All right, 15. What happened to us? I'll tell you what happened. Hassles, pressures, deadlines, stress. I mean, very real adult stuff, let's, let's be honest. But how do we miss what Jesus said to his disciples on that last night? A couple of times, if you read it, John 14, 15, 16, 17, he's like, my joy, I, I come to give my joy to you, complete, full joy. A joy that, and a peace that this world does not, does not understand. It surpasses circumstances. And it's that incredible joy that, hey, I have salvation. My sins are forgiven. He's building a home for me, quite a place right now, in heaven for me right now. Can you imagine? Jesus Construction Company. And, 
and to know the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and to know that every day has purpose wherever we might be, whatever the job, whatever the circumstances. I mean, there is so much to be joyful about, even in a, in a world uh, and in a country and in and, 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 and times of our lives where it's, it, could be, it could be easy to be gloomy. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Dad, you give me joy. You give me joy. Lesson six. What are toddlers? Eager E for parents. They're so eager for parents, right? I mean, you, you ever been to like a mall or something and a kid gets separated from the parents? Start screaming bloody murder, right? You think someone's trying to kill the kid. Why? It is not acceptable to be separated from mom or dad. I love it when this happens, and I'm with like a younger family, younger couple, and they have their small kids, and then in the course of the, the night or whatever, one of the kids comes up against me and like grabs my hand, and then he, he or she looks up to me, <laughs> sees that I'm not dad, and just like freaks out, like, like, okay, you're some guy, but you're not the right guy, right? So when are we going to get more like that in our lives? Look, you're some guy, but not the right guy. Where's my dad? Where's my father? He's the one I need to be close to. Because he never leaves us, never forsakes us. So eager, eager for parents. I remember, you know, it doesn't happen anymore. But when I used to get home from work and the kids were little, right? Daddy, daddy, right? Where have you been all day, you know? Just that it's not acceptable to be separated from mom and dad. We cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. And lesson seven is real. Aren't they, kids are just so real. They're just so honest. Like, they don't really care what anybody thinks. Like, even to a fault. Uh, I remember my daughter, Nicole, was, was uh, <laughs> at the store. Fortunately, I wasn't there. It's with Dana. She yells out in the line at the Safeway or something, Mommy, she has a big bottom. It's probably true, but I mean, it's <laughs> you're over at someone's house for dinner. One of your kids says, this is yucky. You know, <laughs> now I know you got to train those things. You try to train those things out of them. That's not good. Okay, of course. But here's the thing. There's something there just about that honesty. Just about, there's, you know, they just, there's nothing to hide. They can, they can be real. They're, they're uninhibited. They're not like looking around like, what are people going to think if I run across this room uh, yelling, mommy, mommy. You know, they, they just have that, all I, I'm just focused on her or on him. Well, there's a lot there for us, isn't there? And as a, we could talk a lot longer, but, you know, as a picture, some, some examples of, of how to connect with our Father in heaven. And it says in Matthew 18, 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. That's really what these things are talking about, humility. That's not, hey, look at me. Hey, where would this world be without me? Hey, you know, aren't I something? Aren't I all that? It's not that at all. It's just that, hey, I exist to help you. I exist... Uh, as a dependent, needy person before God to be close with him and to believe in him and, and to be eager for him and to have be filled with joy, humility. Now, why is this the best path? You might be here like, why, why do this? And isn't it, isn't it because of the ultimate child? I mean... Is there any greater child than the one that Isaiah talks about, where Isaiah is talking about he'll be the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the wonderful Counselor, and the Prince of Peace? Remember that verse? What does the first part of that verse say? Unto us a child is born. That Jesus became the ultimate child, this Son of God, came in humility, obeying everything that his father asked him to do. To the point of actually being born, literally becoming a child. 
a toddler, teenager, to obey all that his father asked him to do. And he did all of this, became childlike by humbling himself and going to the cross to die for our sins. He did all of that so we could become children of God. You think about that. You think, in fact, you think even more than that, how the father had his son killed so that we could become children. It's just amazing how we do all of this because of the ultimate child, that perfect son, the sacrifice for us so that what? So that we have the ultimate father. Like you may may have or had a great dad, but Jesus, our father, he's the ultimate father in heaven and the ultimate future home in heaven and the ultimate family of God in heaven. So today... What does this all come down to today? First, become great and welcome a child. I put that in parentheses because it may be somebody who's like a child. That's how we become great, according to Jesus. Also, become more childlike before Father God. Lessons from a toddler. We're not the high and the mighty. We're children of God. And then three, become a child. Some of you here today have not yet said yes to Jesus. And so that's the ultimate childlike entrance. You become like a child, meaning humble. Like I can't save myself. There's no way. It's like a one-year-old. I can't tie my shoe. Ain't going to happen. I can't save myself from my sins. I have to believe and accept what Jesus did for me on the cross as the only way to know God and to get into the kingdom, become a child today. I'm going to close with a story. Uh, um, Forgive me if you've heard me share it before. So there was a missionary family, and it's a true story, and they came home on a home assignment or furlough, and a, a family in the church allowed them to use their lake house, this one Uh, summer uh, to stay at and of course that family really appreciated they really needed some rest and they came and and they so enjoyed that lake house and they had it all to themselves for a couple of weeks and this one day there was like four children in the family of all different ages and this one day as mom was in the house and dad was in the boathouse kind of you know tinkering around uh, one of the one of the older kids was responsible for the youngest uh, little boy a toddler and um they were down by the dock, and, and the girl got distracted for just a, a second, and the little boy fell in, into the murky lake. And loud screams went out. Dad came running down to the dock. He assessed the situation, quickly jumped in. He could not see his hand in front of his face. It was so dark. He was down there trying to find his son. He comes up for air. Dad has to get a breath of air, fills his lungs, goes back down again, trying to find his son. He's just doing this, just reaching, trying to find out where he is. Just as he's about ready to come back up again for a second breath of air, he bumped into something. And he went for it, and it was his son with the death grip around the pylon to the dock. And he pulled his son off the pylon, and they both went up to the top and gasped for air and got out and praised God the boy was safe and and everybody just thanked the Lord and kind of breathed a sigh of relief for the rest of the afternoon dad had son in his arms and just (laughs) you're not going out of my sight and finally as things kind of got back to a sense of normalcy that night at dinner they were sitting around the table and laughing and talking and and, uh, and, and the dad finally couldn't, couldn't resist, resist asking. He, he's, he looks at his son. He says, he says, what were you doing down there? Wrapped around that pylon like you were. And the little guy, his answer just, just reaches out and grabs you by the throat. He said, just waiting for you, dad. 
I was just waiting for you. So, Father, a story like that is so moving because we think about earthly dads and how true it is, the role both dads and moms play. In the eyes of a child, just huge. And yet, Father, Father God, Dad, we thank you that you came for us. You came in. You came in and saved us. When we were at the brink of death, separation from you, thank you for what you've done. And Lord, may we continue to need you in the same way, cry out to you and wait for you, knowing that you will come for us, that you are a good father, you're a good father, Lord. Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you as Savior, that right now they'll say, Jesus, save me, come into my life, forgive me. I want to become a Christian today. And if that's where you're at, just right now in your heart, just ask him and he'll come in. He promises to save those who call upon him and ask. Turn from your sin. Run to Jesus. We're going to have a time of baptism. If there's anybody here that would say, you know, I want to humble myself, obey what Jesus has asked me to do by showing that I'm a Christian by letting my, my body go into the water as a symbol that my sins are forgiven and my life is over, my old life is over and I'm brand new as a Christian. If that's you, if you're interested, just head over to the prayer room. Somebody would love to talk with you about how this all works, what it means to be baptized. We have dressing rooms, change of clothes, towels, all of that. Lord, as, as we take some time and sing and worship, may we just ponder this amazing truth of how good you are, Father, to become great by welcoming the child and to enter your kingdom like a child. So, Lord, work now as we worship. Bring those who you want to bring, Lord, for baptism, for prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.